screen with you. And everybody should be able to see the floodnc.gov website. This is the go-to flood mapping website for the most accurate information. Now I know that the county will use these maps as a layer, which is what we realtors are used to doing. Um, as far as looking up the, the flood zones or whatever for any specific properties we may be working with buyers or sellers on, but you really need to learn how to use this floodnc.gov website. <clears throat> I'm not gonna start with that one though. We're gonna start with GIS because I feel like most people are gonna be able to use the GIS and most realtors understand how to access GIS and use those layers um, more so than the state website. So we're gonna start with the basic version then we're gonna go to advanced, okay? Okay, so first things first, um, full disclosure, I'm just gonna pull up properties that I'm either a listing agent on or a buyer's agent for, so I can give you real world demonstrations of how these different preliminary and effective maps have affected me personally in my business, and they're probably affecting you guys too. So the first thing I'm gonna do in GIS is I'm gonna pull up a property that I have under contract, and we will hopefully close tomorrow on. We'll see how that goes. Um, this particular property is down in Holly Ridge in a neighborhood called Kings Harbor. Um, I'm going to turn on some aerials here. Well, so you can leave that and just call and said he's coming over with that flat. So I told him we were good. Uh -oh. You are muted. You better mute yourself. Or don't tell me anything I can use against you in the next deal we do. You never know. So this property, 120 Camelot Drive, I've got under contract down in Holly Ridge. You can see it's across the street from the water. The first thing to notice is in the map layers, you've, you've had two buttons in there, preliminary and effective for the flood zones for quite some time. This should not be new news to you. So we're gonna work the effective flood maps right now, show the flood zone across the street. Pretty reasonable, the water's over here, waterfront houses are probably gonna have more risk. I mean, that's kind of common sense. Well, let me show you what happens when you flip the preliminary on. Now, do y'all see where they added all of this AE zone and then all of this yellow shaded X zone? Interestingly enough, they're bringing the flood zones across the street. Now, actual real world, like firsthand knowledge, the water never got up to the pavement according to these homeowners on this street in Hurricane Florence and that one specific storm that we had. But of course, the state and their LIDAR cameras and all those things are smarter than all of us, so they're gonna go off of the mapping technology that they have So and look at the elevations and the low areas. So they have deemed this to be a low area. So this homeowner, had we not, well, almost homeowner, had we not checked the preliminary maps as his buyer's agent, he and I would have never had the discussion about the need to secure flood insurance. Um, even though he is in a shaded X zone and he is a veteran and he is a VA loan uh, consumer, um, he's not gonna be required by his lender to have flood insurance on this property. Now, the good news is because it's a shaded X zone, the quote that we got back was like $480 a year. So it was a really cost effective, affordable policy that wasn't going to affect his monthly payment too much and at least he's protected in the event that these maps are proven to be true. Um, if you're not checking the preliminary flood maps on GIS or for your sellers or your buyers so that there's proper disclosure then you are doing a disservice to consumers to all of our buyers and sellers. Take the extra step. Now the main purpose of this Zoom call today is y'all need to know that these preliminary maps for most of the county, I'm gonna say probably 99% of the county, right Angie? Except that one little spot. 99% of the county's preliminary flood maps will go effective June 19th. That is 17 days from today. Literally 17 days. So on June 20th, this will be the new effective map for this property. How does that affect my client? 
if he if you're in a house that's going from not necessarily a structure in a flood zone like this one here um this property right here the structure's not in a special flood hazard area right now but it's moving into an ae zone so this property owner would definitely benefit from securing flood insurance if they don't already have it prior to June 19th. That's why we're having this, this meeting today, this Zoom call and this, this webinar thing, is to show you guys real world situations and scenarios where you can advocate for your consumers and you can keep more deals together and you can even go back to some of your VIP clients, especially that may be in your sphere of influence and send you a lot of business and just double check for them. It might be worth reaching out to them for a phone call and go, hey, I just, I didn't know if you noticed, but I pulled up your property and you know, the, your house is going to be in a flood zone in less than three weeks. You really should call your insurance professional and get a flood quote on your home and try to secure your insurance before the map changes. So it's a really good way to touch base back with your sphere of influence, provide a level of service to them, do a little bit of public service on that side too. So th this is a really good way uh, illustration of how the maps can change dramatically. Christina. Yes. Along those same, um, um, along that same thought, you may also have some customers that have, believe it or not, oceanfront property mm -hmm. that they may not have flood insurance today or they may already have it and they're currently in a flood zone or like a V zone and now they're coming out of the V zone and their insurance should get cheaper. Exactly, yes, great point, Ryan. Um, I've got a listing down on Topsail Beach in a Pender County part of the area. Um, that house is that exact situation. It's in a VE zone, the structure is in a VE zone. Now my owners don't have a mortgage on it. They're not required to maintain flood insurance and they have not had it since they purchased it over five years ago. But it will be going from a VE to an AE zone. We got the estimate on that flood insurance quote, um, or, on, or on that flood insurance back. Um, we got a quote from SFI Group literally this morning. The flood insurance was going to be thirty-three hundred dollars for the V zone because that's the current map that they have to rate things off of. Once it goes into an AE zone, that's going to drop to about twenty-one hundred dollars. So there's really good savings there and, and cost benefit there. And it's another good reason why you should stay on top of these map changes, especially over the next 30, 60, 90 days. Um, I want to illustrate another property specifically down in this area for you that I've got for sale. It's another good representation of this. Um, 217 Bumps Creek Road, not under contract. Feel free to bring an offer. Got to throw that out there. Um, this property, according to the effective flood zones and the effective flood maps, shows it being in this AE zone back here. The structure of the house is in this AE zone. Now, when we go to the preliminary, though, it is going to be moving to the VE zone. Now, According to the homeowners who had that house built there, water has never gotten up above this line. It's never gotten out of the marsh in any of the storms or any of the rains or any of the natural disaster situations we've you know, experienced. They've never had water come up past this line at this point right here. However, they never had flood insurance on it. Once I explained these new maps to them and I said, look, you're going from this to this, go ahead and secure your policy. They insured this over 4,000 square foot home for $1,172 for a flood policy. So it was better that they secure the policy now rather than later. Save them a ton of money. Anybody have any questions on GIS and the layers specifically or how to look something up? How did I find that? Anybody out there have any questions on that? You can unmute yourself or you can type your questions into the chat box for everybody. I have a question that's not about GIS, but is about flood plans. Okay. So if these people get a quote for flood insurance, they buy a policy before the new maps become effective, 
is the flood insurance company going to recheck their flood zone at the end of that year and increase it, or are they going to be able to keep renewing it at the same rate over and over again? Okay, that's a good question. Let me preface it by saying I'm no insurance professional, so there's that disclosure. What I will tell you is along the same lines of like personal experience with wind and hail, I got my renewal for my homeowners and my wind and hail insurance yesterday. It literally went from $1,600 a year to $2,200 a year. I called my insurance provider and I was like, hey, what's going on with this increase? And they're like, oh, it's just the average increase every year to show appreciation for your home and that it costs more money to build it. And I'm like, no, but I've got a metal roof and I've got fire and burglar protect. Like none of your information is correct. So, I mean, I would say that my insurance company clearly is not looking at anything on an annual basis. They are auto renewing those policies. Now, I would say that the mortgage companies are probably going to keep up with that because the mortgage companies want to make sure that their assets are protected and properly insured. Um, you don't want to get into a forced placement situation with forced placed flood insurance either. That's another reason why realtors, since we have so many people that we're in touch with and, and in our sphere and that we interact with, that we can be advocates for these people because there are a lot of properties that were not in flood zones that will be going into them and they're not aware of it and nobody's telling them. And I feel like the in the homeowner's insurance company, I mean, they're not looking into that. Flood's a completely separate policy. So they're going to end up with forced place mortgage. Um, their mortgage is going to force place insurance on it, which is going to be a ridiculous amount of money. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I doubt that they're going to be looking at it super hard. Now, what I will say is <clears throat> if you get a cheaper, well, a more cost-effective, more affordable flood insurance policy prior to the map changes, and then it switches, and you go from not in a flood zone to in a flood zone, you're going to have one of those grandfathered policies that we always talk about, especially when you're talking about beach properties. But what's likely going to happen is at least you'll get in on the front end on that lower price, and then they will gradually increase it to where it'll be to the correct amount and what it should actually be insured for over a period of five years. It's my understanding, again, I'm no insurance professional. You can talk to the insurance folks about that on another webinar. Um, it's my understanding that they'll increase that at about 20% annually on the difference between the grandfathered policy and how much it would actually be if you went to just go get a brand new one. So that'll be a five year gradual increase. So at least it's a little more palatable. Um, I would not leave it up to the insurance companies or the mortgage companies to be proactive about it. Hey, Christina from, and I'm, from what I've been, what, from what I've heard with different sessions, you know, it's the preferred risk, the preferred rate plan, I believe, or preferred, I think this was called the PRP, the, the preferred rate plan, I believe is what they call it you know, or preferred risk policy, I'm sure, I'm sorry. The, they're transferable and you definitely want to get in on that PRP before the maps change. That's everything that I have heard from Randy Mont and the other folks from the state. So whether the prices go up, like you said, I'm not an insurance agent either. Um, I would want to get that before the new maps go into effect. I think that's the critical piece here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we've got a lot of great insurance business partners with the board. Of course, I would encourage you to give them a little bit of business. They support our association of realtors um, every year religiously, but at least check back in with somebody shop around for rates. This isn't like standard wind and hail that they've already got their algorithm for. There are companies that are cheaper than others when it comes to flood insurance policies. Uh, Christina, Jesse Martinez has a question for you. Okay. Jesse, go ahead and unmute yourself, hon. What is the difference between the A and the AE and the, I think it said AI on there as far as the uh, future um, or preliminary flood maps? And how can you tell them different other than the AE or whatnot listed on the map? Because the symbols are the same. Okay, so the only place that you can, the only, let me back up. The two main letters to remember are A and V, all right? 
V is what we refer to as more velocity. So that is typically going to be indicative of wave action. Um, actual wave action or moving water. Moving water creates a different type of damage to structures than rising water does. If you have water that just fill, it's like filling up a bucket versus spraying it from the side with a water hose. You can knock over that bucket and you can tumble it down your driveway or you can fill it up and watch it float. See, you know what I mean? So I hope that that kind of makes sense with the A's versus the V's. The V's is usually more wave action, more velocity, um, more damaging type water incidents and flood incidents. The A zones, again, are more rising water. As far as between the A, the AE, and the AO, I'm not gonna speak on that. I really just look at shaded X, which you're typically not required to have the flood insurance on, like my example at 120 Camelot, but you probably wanna get it. Um, the V for the, the wave action and velocity water and the A for the rising water. Um, as far as how to actually determine that, like you can even see on this property with 217 bumps, there's a portion of A zone, A zone on the back of this property. And it comes really close to that detached garage. This is where an elevation certificate comes into play. Um, first thing you should know is the county and the cities all maintain um, elevation certificates on file. If you go to build a house in a flood zone, they're going to require you to have an elevation certificate as part of the documentation to get your permits and actually build the house. Um, the county keeps those on record and so does the city of Jacksonville. Um, most municipalities do, especially in the beach towns. If I'm working with a seller or a property owner, even as a buyer's agent, and we know that there should be an elevation certificate there because it's probably always been in a flood zone, First place I call, if the seller can't provide me one and says, I don't know where one is, I have no idea. First person you call, if they have a flood policy, is their insurance company. Their insurance company has an elevation certificate because that's what they're basing the insurer, that's what they're basing the insurance off of. They have to have the lowest, the measurement above um, sea level for the lowest horizontal structural member and that's all done by a surveyor. Um, if the seller doesn't have flood insurance, then their insurance company probably doesn't have one, obviously. So that's when you go back to the county, if it's in county limits, you go to the city of Jacksonville, um, you go to the town of Topsail Beach, Surf City, Richlands, Holly Ridge, whatever. They keep those on file. I try, if I have a client who gets a new elevation certificate as part of a real estate transaction and not something that's required for a building permit or an improvement permit of any reason, <coughs> excuse me, I try to send a copy of that elevation certificate and be proactive to the municipality or to the county so they can add it there for future historical documentation, then at least it's on file. So I know that that is a free service that the county provides, and I know the city of Jacksonville provides. You can call up there. The information is on the board's Facebook page. It's on the website. We've kind of got it everywhere. You can call, um, give them the property address, maybe a parcel number, and they will pull all kinds of information that they have on that specific site for you to use for proper disclosure. Now, as a realtor, please remember, we all know the saying, be the source of the source, but not the source. So we want to provide any information that may be out there, especially anything that's public record may be deemed as a material fact if you got into a situation. So, I mean, if the city of Jacksonville has a copy of an elevation certificate on file, that's a public record. You have access to those public records, so you should have a copy of them and you should be disclosing them. Same thing like with these flood maps. Um, these flood maps have been out for a long time. The preliminary ones have been out for a while and they are a public record. So if your client or a real estate deal kind of goes south and it's over the flood zone changes or something and you didn't provide this preliminary flood zone to them, you might be in some trouble. I mean, um, that, that's why we're trying to be proactive and educate everybody on the tools available to them um, so that you know how to pull these things up. And of course, there are going to be instances where the city or the county do not have an elevation certificate on file. Again, 
<clears throat> maybe the flood map changed and it was not in a special flood hazard area when the home was built 25 years ago. But over time, the map changes have made it now it is in a special flood hazard area. There's probably no reason why the city or the county would have an elevation certificate on file for that property because it wasn't required for the building permit or during the time of construction. Is that safe to say, Ryan? Yeah. Okay. I see a nod. Okay. Just make sure I'm giving accurate information there. Thank you. Christina? Um, yeah. This is Angie. Um, the other thing with the preliminary maps, and, and I encourage people to, even if you are more familiar with Go Maps and you start with Go Maps, to double check things with the frizz, that NC frizz, because, and, and we do that in writing permits, um, just to, you know, just make sure you've got all the information. The, the other thing that's on these new maps, um, which is complicates matters, unfortunately, is what's called the coastal A zone. And um, it's not on Go Maps right now, you don't see that in the preliminary information. The frizz, there's actually a line, it's a limb, it's called the limwa, the uh -huh. limit of moderate wave action is what that stands for. And everything water would of that, even though it may show that it's in an AE, you really, um, it's in a coastal A zone and many of the, or the, the VE standards is what apply um, with the, except with the, if you have an enclosed space, the, you have to have the um, breakaway walls, but you also have to have flood vents in those coastal A zones. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to, to Look at both maps for that information and look to see if the, that property is within that coastal A zone. So Great. I have a question as well. Okay. So um, some lots will, I mean, uh, some properties will have like another lot, which will be like an offsite lot or an offsite septic field that have now come into the preliminary flood zone. Is that going to affect their insurance as well? And then will that take any effect in the existing owners? Again, I'm no insurance professional, but what I'll say is typically your insurance is covering your improvements and the insurance covers improvements vertical on the site. Um, your homeowner's insurance doesn't cover your water meter. You know what I mean? Your, your homeowner's insurance doesn't usually cover your septic if it messes up in the ground. It's only going to cover when the septic backs up into your home and damage is done to the structure that it's insuring. So my guess, my first instinct is to say that if you've got a house that does not sit within a special flood hazard area and is not shown on either the effective or the preliminary maps, but it has an off-site septic or a separate lot that may have some flood zone on it, then my guess is going to be that it should not affect the insurance. Um, Christina, can I? Uh-huh. I, I had a situation here where I think sometimes the mortgage companies pull up the parcel and they look to see whether there's flood insurance, uh, flood zones on it or not. And I had one resident where they were told they were going to have to obtain flood insurance because there was flood zones on the property. And basically they had to deal with their mortgage company to basically demonstrate that the house wasn't on or within the flood zone. So it's possible that you get a notice from the mortgage company saying you've got to get it and you kind of have to kind of deal with fighting that issue mm -hmm. with your mortgage company. Cause I did have that happen over near Elizabeth Lake within the last five years. Yeah. So that goes back to the mortgage companies forcing uh, force placed insurance onto these properties potentially. And that's going to be in an exorbitant amount. Um, I would be surprised if that homeowner was not required to provide an elevation certificate to back up the claim of the elevation of the structure on the site. Um, so that goes back to call a surveyor, get an elevation certificate. Um, I actually did an interview with a local surveyor recently. So y'all should see the video coming out at some point. Heather will post it to Facebook and maybe send it out. Um, and it's questions about surveys and elevation certificates, um, just so everybody can learn a little bit about their process and fees and turnaround times. Um, back to that limb line that Angie was mentioning, um, Pender County has already put that in their GIS as a layer, um, just so 
if you're working down that way a little bit to our, in our neighbors to the south in that county, um, you know that you can click that layer. And what Angie was referring to as far as the increased standards, so you might be in an AE zone or you may have no flood zone at all on your property. However, your property is east or ocean side of that limb wall line then your building requirements are going to increase as if you were building a home in a VE flood zone. So like Angie was saying, you're gonna be required to have flood vents, you're gonna be required to have breakaway walls on the ground levels. Um, there are definitely increased expenses for building to those standards. And that's something um, that needs to be considered. And, and that's gonna to apply to any improvements too. Like if somebody wanted to add on an addition to their home or put on a big back deck or anything like that, that would require a permit, those would also have to meet those standards, correct Angie? Okay. That's what I figured. So, what, go ahead. What would, what would happen, so like if this property comes in, and they're now in an AE zone, and they're required an elevation certificate for their property that's on a concrete foundation, um, does that elevation certificate then, to get approved for it after the fact we're trying to sell that property, um, require them to lift the home up off of its concrete foundation, or does it just say you don't have one, so your insurance for this property is going to be more expensive? Okay. Um, so, yeah. uh, okay, Angie, uh, take that one. Um, in the flood world, substantial improvement is, is what makes that determination. So, and that's based on the percentage of the structure. So, if you look at the tax value, you, you remove the, the lot and accessory buildings, it's just the principal structure. And once you're improvements or damage if there's been a storm or something reaches 50 percent of that structure value then compliance with the current standard is mandated which could very well mean elevation if that's the case or um, adding flood vents it just depends on you know what the situation is so that substantial damage um, we've had a recent um, situation with one if you've got somebody looking at an older structure, especially, and they're looking at buying it to remodel it or do, you know, whether they're going to flip it or keep it or, or whatever, please have them contact their local jurisdiction and get some guidance before they jump into something. Because it, it could be that they can phase improvements because that's a, depending on the local ordinance. I know with the counties, it's a one year look back. Um, so you could potentially, there could be a workaround. If it's damaged, then there's not a workaround. But if it's where they're looking at doing some improvements over time, there might be a workaround. But, you know, people need to be aware of that if they're buying an older property, especially, or, or just even any, any property now with the, with the map changes. Because one of the things that, um, that has happened in a, in a lot of our areas where it was an AE9, say, and now it's going to be an AE13. So it might be a newer home that was built just last year that was compliant. It's not going to be compliant once the new maps take effect. So it's not just changing from one zone to the other, but the elevation requirement could be different. So um, we don't like to cause people grief and if we can help people work, you know, then, then we can, but it, once somebody gets moving, you can't go back. And so uh, substantial improvement is, is a big deal. So it's not presumptive damage, it's actual damage. So if they were not in a flood zone and now they're in an AE zone, then they're not, with their elevation certificate, they're not required to do any kind of improvement to the home. Not it, just because it's changing title or, or no, but if they were to want to improve it or if they got damage and, and after Florence, you know, many of the damaged homes weren't from flood, they were from wind and hail, but it didn't matter. It was damaged because we, we have people say, oh, but it didn't flood. I understand that. But once you reach that damage threshold of 50%, then compliance is, is mandated. So I'm sure. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. 
and it could also be two storms within the same year period. Mm -hmm. Right, and we told people like after Florence, they might be just under being substantially damaged, but you know, the HVAC unit, you know, dried out and they thought it was going to work. Well, if six months down the road, it quits, that might kick you into substantial at that point because there's that six, you know, one year look back. Or if you just did a remodel right before a storm. So investors and people who work with investors that like to fix and flip, take note of that because they're going to be affected too. And that definitely affects their numbers and their bottom line and of course is going to affect their investment strategies. Right. Other questions before we move on to the Frist website. Hey, Christina, just real quick. Um, as you were kind of going over, uh, we got kind of locked on to a different topic, but for the agents who really don't know much about elevation certificates, you were kind of giving a, um, a line of a chain of command on, on how they should go about that. So the first thing to do was to ask the seller. Mm -hmm. The second thing, if they had flood insurance, ask the insurer. Third thing, go to the city or county. So if none of those, if like Ryan said, they just don't have one on file, their next step is surveyor. Yep, a surveyor is the only person who can actually provide an elevation certificate with their seal. And that's the only one that will cost money. Uh, that's going to cost money, yes, because yeah. the county and the cities all have those and those they provide those as a public service and they retain those records as a public service for us. Um, so yeah, the one that's going to cost money is going to be um, going to the surveyor. Now, in the instance of 120 Camelot Drive, the first house that I showed you that we close on tomorrow, um, you know, we were able to effectively negotiate to have the seller pay for that elevation certificate. That way, if something happened with us, at least they were in control of it and they had a copy for their own insurance moving forward or for future buyers. So, I mean, it's just my personal opinion that I think if it's, if you need one with regards to a transaction, I personally would ask the sellers to pay for that. Um, but it, nevertheless, somebody's going to have to pay for them. And I've seen the prices ranging everywhere from $350 to $1,000. There's really no going rate. Um, it's going to depend on where the property is, what it is, and how busy the surveyor you call is and, and when you need it, obviously. Okay. Christina, one other thing. Mm-hmm. One other thing is we, I've had two people with Florence that flooded, that were in a flood zone, that were able to take an elevation certificate and have their surveyors apply for a letter of map amendment and they are no longer in the current flood zones because they shouldn't have been in a flood zone to begin with. So there's some other benefit of having that elevation certificate as well. That's a really good point, Ryan. Thank you for bringing that up. So, you know, even if you've got somebody who the preliminary map show going into one of these special flood hazard areas and they don't agree with it and they're like, look, water's never gotten anywhere close to my house. Yeah, it flooded my neighbors, but it never got to my yard. That might be a really good justification for them to invest in that elevation certificate, do that letter of map amendment, as Ryan mentioned, and um, go back and try to get that map changed and, and revised to remove them from that flood hazard area. Think about how much of a hero you would be to your clients if you could help them do those things. There is a question in the chat uh, regarding the coastal hazard addendum. Is flood X a designated flood zone? Well, if you look, first of all, make sure you're looking at the new coastal hazards addendum. Well, no, wait, we haven't changed that yet. That's coming. We're working on that. Stay tuned. On the coastal hazards addendum, you've either got, it's in a federal flood zone, it's not in a federal flood zone, or it's not in a designated flood zone. So, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody how to fill that out. The only thing that I will advise you on is you need to know in the Cobra zones, and they're not just on North Topsail Beach, y'all, they, they actually spread up and down the coast and they are nationwide. If you have a property that's located within a Cobra zone for the Coastal Barrier Resources Act overlay, those properties are not eligible for federal flood insurance through the National Flood Insurance Program, which are FEMA-backed policies. So that's when you're gonna put on that coastal hazards denim that it is 
not in a federal flood zone. It's in a private flood zone. But that's about all I'm going to tell you on how to fill that out. Um, I have been over the past, I would say six months to a year on the coastal hazards addendum that I've been using. Um, I actually, if there's a change, I'll mark, a, I'll check one box and, and write effective and have my client's initial and sign beside it. And then I'll check the other box and be like preliminary map showed this zone. And then I'll have my client's initial and sign that there. That way I've disclosed the change. I've disclosed them both and they know up front. So that might be something that you need to go back and talk to your managing broker with or your broker in charge and get guidance on your company and them and which way they would prefer you to do that. Any other questions before we start playing around in the Frist website? Not yet? All right, going once, going twice. All right, so flood.nc.gov. This is going to be a really good resource for you guys. Just double check. Um, as we all know, tax records are not always accurate. Um, GIS, the lines on the maps and the aerials are not always accurate. They can be just a hair off, but you know what? That little hair on the screen can translate into four or five feet actually on site if you're talking to a surveyor or looking at a property, you know, in live person. Same thing with the flood zones. You know, our county officials and GIS folks do a fantastic job putting these layers over so that we can check all those little boxes on the GIS site and get the layers and get the aerials and all the things, but they're not always 100% accurate. So same thing with flood zones. <clears throat> what I'll tell you is the mortgage companies, as far as I know, look at the Frist websites. The insurance companies <clears throat> rate insurance policies based off of the Frist website. Um, I don't know of any of those official people that are necessarily using GIS. GIS is kind of your first look. Oh, wait, hey, I should really look into this a little bit more. So then you end up over here on flood.nc.gov. First thing you can do is you can just type in an address. It'll pull you up. It'll give you your search results and it's going to show you kind of the areas, the zone, the flood panels, the elevations. That's what the ELs are in here for, if you can see those. And then you've got just a straight up flood risk profile, you know, color coded, whatever. Of course, there's going to be a link for get flood insurance quotes. Um, that's kind of like all them pay per click leads like we get as realtors. Yeah, insurance brokers do that too, y'all. Did you know that? Um, you can look on just this basic flood risk profile. It's going to give you basic elevation. That's probably not entirely accurate. It's showing how much of an impacts on there, estimates for the insurance. And I can tell you that is not accurate at all whatsoever based off of the policy my owner secured for that. But what you can do is you can actually go to the Frist website from there. Oh no, it's not accurate here. Hang on. Let me get back up there. Let's go this way. You can go to the Friss website. This is the one when we keep talking about flood risk information system. That's what this stands for when we talk about Friss. Two states are covered by this uh, mapping program. And you can go in here and you can literally select by county. You can check any county in the state if you want to. You can start poking around in the mountains. I mean, you know, did you know that there are more flood insurance claims made in Mecklenburg County right here? than anywhere else in the state of North Carolina? Fun fact, flooding and flood hazards are not just a coastal issue, just so you know. So you can go over here, click on our Onslow County area. And yeah, there's a way that you can do a little search and there's an address bar and all kinds of things. I don't know, I, I find those a little bit harder to use. I, I'm a Zoomer, I like to just kind of I don't. Them. I don't think the address search works very well in the first <laughs> map anyhow, just so you know. It doesn't, it, like very rarely have I ever gotten it to actually pull up an address. So I, I, I just kind of find my spot and I'll zoom in. I mean, you should know where the properties are that you're representing, right? I think we can all agree on that. Um, so what we're gonna do is jump over here to Bumps Creek Road. And here is that property 
that we were just looking at on GIS, my great big expensive waterfront listing. Um, the maps look about the same as far as where the lines go, but here's where y'all need to be checking. See up here in this top right corner, see this button, it says effective. Anytime you pull this up, it's only gonna show you the effective map. You have to flip that to preliminary to see the new lines. Okay, so you can toggle effective, and you can go to the preliminary maps. There are all types of data in here that you can play around with if you want to. Like, look, it's, it's and again, it's not entirely accurate. This house is 44, 45 even square feet. So they kind of have that wrong a little. But you've got annual chance of flood. There's other reports and data that you can look at. I mean, but the main point of what we're doing here because we're not insurance professionals. The realtors, you shouldn't be quoting flood risk. And we're saying anything like, I don't think this house is gonna flood. You know, you, you just need to show people what's available with the data and the public records that we have so that you can show them why they need to ask an insurance person about flood insurance and about the cost. Um, it's just making them aware. So you can go between effective and then you can go to the preliminary. Um, there are some layers over here. Now, if you go to the little layer button, that limwa line that we were talking about with Angie earlier is right there. Okay, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you'll be able to actually see this limwa line when I turn it on. Ready? All right, let me close this. Now you see this little red and black line on here? on our map, <clears throat> this is that limb wall line. So what that means is, like Angie was saying, anything that's on the ocean side, everything on, this, on the bottom below this line, actually where it's oriented on the screen, anything below this line, all these structures, all the lots that are left in this area, they are all gonna have to be built or constructed to VE zone standards. Regardless of whether this house is in the AE zone right here, if they do substantial improvement, right Angie? <clears throat> substantial improvement to the, these houses right here, even though they're in AE zone and not in the VE zone, these are gonna be required to meet the building requirements for the V zone because they are oceanward on the ocean side of this line. Let that sink in a second. I gotta know, how many of y'all even knew that the Limwa line was a thing? Anybody? Exactly. See, I'm so glad that all of y'all are here. And I think about all those other realtors that have no idea and aren't gonna know. You automatically know more than some of your competitors. Congratulations, you learned something today. So, what you need to keep in mind for, uh, in mind with anything that's anywhere near the coast, you need to check this Frisk website for this limb wall line because that's going to affect, especially if you're dealing with investors or you got a rehab or like Angie said, an older home. This is going to affect the building requirements, whether they have to elevate the structure, put in flood vents, do breakaway walls, whether they're even going to be allowed to rebuild a structure in the event it gets damaged the way that it was, it might have to have pilings. You know, you may have to elevate that structure. You're gonna have additional expense rebuilding these homes because of this limb wall line. Anybody have any questions on that before we go forward? Oh, I see Heidi's. Can you use the frisk to view Cobra? Yes, that's the CBRS right down here. <clears throat> there is a layer for that. Now, if you check the layer, let me zoom out a little bit more. Here, let me get rid of a couple things for you. So there's your regular map. If you turn on the Cobra Zone, right here, everything that's in the little liney pattern, that's all Coastal Barrier Resources Act area. There's over 6,000 acres in this area, in the North Topsail Beach area um, that are part of the Cobra Zone. 
Um, I will say I was on a legislative committee Zoom meeting this morning with the state association and um, the Topsail Board of Realtors, along with support from the state, is going to uh, appeal to national to try to get them to remove a lot of this area. But what you should keep in mind is, look, this Cobra Zone comes over onto the mainland in some areas. So it's not just a North Topsail Beach issue. It's a anywhere there's water issue. Um, here's some of the Pelican Point area. And actually there are some structures. Okay, right here, Waterway Drive. This is a perfect example of an area that's on the mainland that is affected by the Coastal Barrier Resources Act that has additional building requirements. None of these homes can get federally backed flood insurance. These all have to have private flood. Sometimes those policies can be more cost effective. Sometimes those policies actually have better coverage depending on your use of the structure. That's a whole other class for another day though. But to answer your question, Heidi, yes, you, you actually can use Spriss to view the Cobra zones. Anybody else have any questions about the Limois? or the Cobra Zones or any of that before we start digging a little bit deeper into some of this. Okay, not hearing any. So the other thing that I think pretty much everybody on the call can agree with, if you start messing around with these preliminary flood maps, <clears throat> they don't exactly match up with where the water actually was following Hurricane Florence. Um, I know of several areas that had some flood damage that are not represented as going into a special flood hazard area on these new maps. For that reason, there are counties and municipalities that have um, appealed these maps and are trying to get them changed. Um, Ryan, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to kind of speak on the city of Jacksonville and why you guys chose to appeal some of the areas in the city, um, kind of what your strategy was for that and how those plans are moving forward. Because like I said in the beginning of this, y'all, the county is pretty much all going effective with these, what are now preliminary maps, they will become effective on June 19th and 17 days, with the exception of some portions of the city of Jacksonville and a very small little portion of the county. So Ryan, I'm gonna turn it over to you on that. So the city of Jacksonville, we are, we appeal to flood maps. Uh, there's one exception which council adopted back in April and it's already effective, is panel 4398. It's the last panel uh, on New Bern Highway in our northern part of our jurisdiction and, and FEMA requested that we go ahead and adopt that Primarily, as I understand it, because about 70, 80% of it's in the county's jurisdiction to begin with, and the appeal really wasn't going to impact that parcel um, all that substantial. Yeah, right there near where it says pump, 4398. So, um, unfortunately, you'd have to look to see where the city of Jacksonville ETJ line is. I don't believe the frizz isn't going to show at number one. I don't even think the county's GIS shows our ETJ, so you may have to look at the city's GIS program to make sure that, and even that's not 100% accurate all the time, we've just recently reduced our ETJ, so you won't be able to see the current GIS map, so that's where I always tell people, you know, that's a good place to start, but to confirm, always reach out to your, your local jurisdiction having uh, the authority there, but basically after I'm a Jacksonville native. I, I grew up here in Jacksonville. I've been here my entire life with the exception of my college years and a few years that I lived in Wilmington. And, um, you know, after the new flood maps were released, you know, showing the downtown area as a um, going to a flood elevation 10, uh, talking to different owners in the downtown area, having understanding of the downtown area, Along with, there was a couple of other areas that really just kind of jumped out to me, the Belfort Combs area. If you look at the proposed, the preliminary um, flood map for the Belfort Combs area, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I started asking questions. 
And it turns out that that area is, they called it hydraulically disconnected. But the more of the stories, if you, can you zoom into the Belfort homes, the, the coal drive, kit drive, right in the middle there, Christina? What, which ones, these right here? Uh, no, the Belfort Combs area. Okay, what panel? Um, hold on. Can you find um, Gum Branch, Belfort Road, and Country Club? Yeah. You're right there. So, uh, Going to be the bottom left of the screen there. Right there. So if you'll zoom in right there, look how that line looks that cuts right through Belfort Combs. It's going to be right there on the right-hand side under your legend there on the right. So all those homes in Belfort Combs would have to get flood insurance. Well, if you look, go to the effective. It just, it didn't make a lot of sense the way that that changed. And then the other issue that we recognized, if you look at Carolina Forest, um, there, the state's using 2001 LIDAR data. Well, think about the development that occurred in Jacksonville since 2001 you know, Carolina Forest being a major, you know, development that occurred after 2002. So there's a lot of earth movement that took place in just that one subdivision. So because of those, those are kind of three highlights of things that I recognize just kind of looking at the map zones, you know, that basically caused us to raise some questions. Um, I also think that, um, you know, from talking to other people and looking at stuff, you know, there's some anomalies south of Cape Lookout, areas that historically have not flooded or being placed in flood zones and areas north of Cape Lookout that have historically flooded or were made better, that it just didn't really make sense. So we made several trips to Raleigh and we hired Applied Technology Management, which is uh, ATM, it's an international company. And there's a few things that they basically pointed out in our discussions with the state. They agreed, and I think Moorhead City was the other location that appealed the maps as well. I think everybody else pretty much, there's been some other appeals as well, but that's the primary uh, two people south of the Cape Lookout area that has kind of you know challenged the maps. And um, they've done some preliminary work, and I'm optimistic that between the new the new studies the river gauges that were deployed that they basically used to validate or help validate based on what florence saw you know to me florence and i know they don't like to use the number of year storms but i think florence for jacksonville was was somewhere greater than a hundred year storm i know it wasn't a category three and we didn't necessarily have the storm surge associated with it but it was just such a unique storm in the richlands area i think it was a thousand year storm so basically they were able to use those river gauges to kind of compare that to, well, what did the model say the storm would do? And um, I'm optimistic that the, the values um, will reduce with a combination of using the 2015 LIDAR data, um, the Creek and Riverine stuff, they've told me that they've seen about 20% reductions with the Riverine and Creek models. Um, that's part of it. So. Um, they agreed to rerun the models for us. And now I think everybody else is around, right under, uh, Angie, was it 650 model storms, something like that, around 650. And I think that now we're going to end up with about 750 model storms with the appeal. So we're hopeful to see the results of the modeling sometime the end of this year, the beginning of 2022. I'm sorry, beginning of 2021. And um, we'll see kind of how that, how that looks at the end of the day, but we just, it, it just didn't seem right to us. And uh, the problem is, is that you can't just go to the state and say it doesn't seem right. You know, they basically want scientific data. And that's why, you know, council agreed to hire ATM and start that process. And we also, the city manager and the deputy manager and myself, we, we went to Raleigh and we met with um, uh, Dan, um, John Dorman at the time, he's since retired, but uh, to kind of talk about, you know, the situation that exists here in Oslo County. Another big issue is, you know, the, the New River is not like the Cape Fear or the, or the Pamlico or the Noose River. It starts and ends in one county. So we don't have the flooding scenario that you see in Fayetteville and Greenville and um, Kinston uh, two weeks after the storm event. 
So, so we've appealed and we're just waiting for the results uh, to that appeal. And unfortunately, it's just not a fast process. Now, let me ask you this. So in the instance of more stormwater flooding, not river tributary creek rising flooding, are those some of the areas that maybe are in some of your appeals too? Um, would, would that be justification if you know that there's an area, like uh, we all know of a couple spots in Jacksonville where every time we get the monsoon, there's like water in people's houses. Um, you know, are, are those taken into consideration at all with these flood map revisions? We, we've appealed them all. So other than that panel 4398, and we appealed it originally, they just asked us to back that out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they are redoing the, the because Jacksonville, we have both, uh, and the same with Onza County, we've got riverine flooding, and we also have the coastal flooding. So they're rerunning the models for our area, uh, and that's only going to be for the Jacksonville panels, as I understand it. So it's not going to make the county panels better or worse, depending on what they find. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And, you know, thank you guys, like, from the county and the city for not making a huge knee-jerk reaction to this, like Pender County did. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't involved in Pender County politics or, or some of the decisions that they try to make, um, they were trying to change building requirements and things based off of Hurricane Florence's maps which would have basically been trying to regulate what they were going to call, I think, a 700-year floodplain, which was a little bit excessive. It would have literally rendered about 80% of Pender County unbuildable and unusable. Um, Pender County actually split their maps up as far as adoption. It's my understanding that the western part of the county has actually already adopted their maps, and they will be going into effect soon if we haven't got a date on it yet. And then the eastern portion of the county, they have appealed um, because they ran into a lot of the same discrepancies that you guys did with the city of Jacksonville. Like it just doesn't make any sense. There was no rhyme or reason there. Um, and it didn't necessarily have a lot to do with the beach towns, the Surf City and Topsail Beach. There, there were a lot of mainland um, flood issues with the preliminary maps that they wanted to get corrected and get fixed. So um, we still don't have any idea when the eastern portion of Pender County is going to be adopting or putting into effect the, re the preliminary maps. But those layers are in GIS for you in the Pender County system, just as they are in the Onslow County system. Yeah, my personal observation of things that I've looked at, I think your beach towns actually get better. Yeah, your, the, in, your inland communities get worse. Yeah, um, I've got a few beach properties that are listed for sale right now. And like you say, you know, they're going from it, like second row properties going from a VE to an AE zone, like I was mentioning earlier in the Zoom. Um, so it, just double check. I mean, that that's the message behind this, guys. It's be the source of the source, not the source. Go back as a good service to your clients and just take a minute and check the flood zones and see if it warrants reaching out for a phone call trying to either you're either going to be helping someone save money or helping someone protect their property better or helping someone protect their property at a more affordable rate rather than what the mortgage company is going to put on their mortgage um, to make sure that they're properly protected does anybody else have any other questions we are right at an hour and in the best interest of everybody's time y'all know i like to be on time so I don't want to keep you any longer than I have to, but I also don't want anyone to leave this with unanswered questions. Christina, while everybody else is kind of putting their thoughts together, my only question is, um, I was just trying to, I was kind of playing around on the floodnc.gov and on that go to Fris when that security warning comes up, what do you do to get out of that? Um, hang on a second and let me do that. Uh, of course, <laughs> ncfloodmaps.com. What I do is I go up here to this button okay. right on the home page at the top right. I mean, okay, Angie or Ryan, can y'all even tell me what the Feynman is? Because I don't even know what the Feynman is. Oh, Feynman's really cool. That's the flood inundation map alert network. 
that basically uses all the river gauges. There's about 400 of them in the state. Uh -huh. And based on the rains that we had last week, it will actually show you the river stage and, and you can basically model, well, what if we had the new river rise to 7.27 feet that happened during Florence? It'll show you the areas closest to that gauge where the water will basically be covering the ground. That's super cool. Okay, now I have a new thing to go play around with, like a nerd. Especially, especially during a heavy rain event, it, it's, it's a neat tool. Awesome. Okay, I'll have to play with that website. But yeah, Amy, um, I, I just go right up here to the, honestly, it's a click through for me. I, I very rarely work on the floodnc.gov. Um, I typically just go straight to the press website for the okay. information I'm looking for. Yep, and that worked just fine. I just could not get that link from after you click on the house to go through, so. Yeah. Maybe we need to send an email. Hey, Angie or Ryan, do y'all like know who maintains this? They need to know they have a broken link. I, I don't know who maintains it. I'm, I'm sure it's the North Carolina Department of Emergency Services. All right. The flood mapping office. We'll put Tyler Newman from base on that for us. There you go. Yeah. I mean, Tyler. if 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 you can if you can email me where it's broken, okay. I, can, I can forward that to um, to Tom Langan or Dan, somebody at the state, or Dan just left Tom or somebody at the state. Okay, that sounds good. And you know what, we may need to do um, because there's so much information in this Frisk website. Um, Amy, maybe we can get together and, and find someone who's not me that actually uses all the tools in it um, to have a, a Frisk class. Um, so maybe we can work on that in the future and, and some of you attendees can come to that one and we can learn some more things. Um, like another tool that I use in here in, in my beach class um, and, and for beach properties is you can actually see the erosion rates all the way down the beach and you can see which sections of beach are adding sand to their dunes and which sections are taking away and it ain't all north topsail beach it's losing sand y'all so um maybe we can do that in the future at some point um, we got one more question in the chat box so tammy said so am i understanding correctly if a property is going to be in a flood zone come june 20th it's best for the owner to get insurance now all right i'll answer that question it can't hurt it's kind of like think health insurance you got pre-existing conditions and then you got stuff that just pops up later. Uh, I would say that it would almost be a pre-existing condition if you can go ahead and get the insurance now and secure that lower rate um, because you're going to have cheaper flood insurance if you right now today, it does not say that you're in a flood zone. But then June 20th, you are going to be in one. I would say probably nine times out of 10, it's going to be a cheaper policy. And then second- I would do it by the 18th. Yeah, do it by the 18th so it goes into effect by midnight on the 18th because the 19th at 12.01 a.m., that is a effective math. Um, second part to her question, also my understanding that it's transferable to a new buyer at the cheaper rate. That's kind of an it depends. Flood insurance policies are transferable so long as the mortgage company on the other side will allow it and the insurance company will allow the transfer. Um, and going back to that cheaper rate, yes, you would initially get the cheaper rate up front, but just know that it may adjust at 20% a year over the course of five years to get to the actual rate. Those are fantastic questions for the insurance Zoom class that they're gonna have later. And Heather, when is that one gonna be for everybody's knowledge? That is on Thursday at 10 o'clock. Exactly, so tomorrow at 10 a.m., right? No, Thursday. Thursday. Tomorrow, Wednesday. Dang, it's only <laughs> Yeah. Can I get an invite to that? Absolutely. I can send that to you, no problem. And my, my last thing before we kind of shut out of here is um, I didn't know, Angie or Ryan, if you would like to put any of your contact information out there, if you want to put it in the chat thing, if you want people to be able to contact you from here. Um, it do not feel like you have to, uh, but that is just always something we offer if, if that is something that you think would help you as if realtors could contact you and get the correct answers. We'd be happy to have that information. Um, I just sent 700 emails out the other day. I'm, based I, on the, the responses, I got that I'm one. Sure I flooded everybody's email with my contact information at this point, but I, you, you can share it, not a problem. 
Yeah, and that, that was that was great. If you guys um, have not checked your spam folders, if you did not see that email from him, you should have gotten it. And the flyers attached to the bottom, the brochures are fantastic. Those should be going out to everybody. They were really well written, really easy to understand. And those should definitely be going out. Um, as always, um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but I am Amy, I'm the education committee chair and we are always looking for classes that you want um, starting in july we're going to try something new where we teach a class on tuesday and then we basically do a deep dive on a thursday rather than doing a completely separate class and that's kind of what this is going to be between having christina's class here today and then having insurance to answer questions we're going to try to do that all through july more on like value assigning to houses and all of that but um, we'd really like to continue to do some of that. So Christina's idea, if everybody can kind of play around on this and really learn how to use these systems, we would love to put a second class together, a follow-up class on how to do the more specifics and frizz and some of the other stuff. But we just really want you guys to know the tools first so that you can come with questions for anything that you've found since then. It's really been a sticking point for you. So please do play around on this. Please do make sure you are getting all of this information out to your buyers and sellers. That is a really, really good way to put yourself back in front of them and get that top of mind awareness by um, just going ahead and clicking on the, the prelim and the effectives and just seeing how that changes for every house that you have contact with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if nobody else has any questions, thank you, Christina, Angie, and Ryan for your time. We really do appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who, um, who came and participated in everything today. We're really loving this Zoom platform for classes, and we just want to continue bringing you as much information as we can. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate the opportunity. And again, thanks to Angie and Ryan. We appreciate y'all. Thanks, guys.